Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast today. I am absolutely over the moon to introduce to you Mr. Stephen J. Sansweet to the podcast, the ultimate collector, the ultimate Star Wars fan, and just a really smart, intelligent person, and we can't wait to talk with you. Hi Stephen, welcome to the show. Hello Ingrid, hello Lindsay. Hello Stephen. Um, I'd like to start today by um, asking you what, when you first came into contact with Star Wars and what was the very first collectible that you managed to get and do you still have it? Well, I have been a collector of all kinds of things all my life. I think I inherited a collector gene from my dad who helped me collect matchbook covers and comic books and I collected baseball trading cards when I was really young in my in my early years and in my, into my early teens. So I have this collector mentality about me. And I had started collecting space toys, Japanese space toys, like um, uh, tin battery operated robots and spaceships and things of that nature. And then I had heard about this movie called Star Wars. At the time, I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. We covered Hollywood out of the Los Angeles office. I eventually became the Hollywood reporter for three years, and I became a deputy bureau chief and then a bureau chief. But my first collectible for Star Wars actually coincides with my being a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Early in 1977, a marketing brochure that was made by Lucasfilm and 20th Century Fox, mainly for theater bookers, people who actually book movies into the movie theaters, went out. It was this 24-page, full-color, beautiful, great scenes from the movie and information in it. And it went to the guy who then covered movies for the journal. And he's looking at it, and I'm sort of slobbering a little and salivating and I'm looking over his shoulder at the book and then he throws it into his wastebasket and so I waited until he left for the day and tiptoed over to the wastebasket and that was my first dumpster diving for Star Wars but not the last and so okay. that is still in my collection I've got a second one because some of the pages have gotten loose on this thing it came in a cardboard portfolio with a black wrapper that said Star Wars around it inside this uh, envelope. And it's, it's a precious reminder of my days at the journal and how I first learned about Star Wars. So you were there right, right from the beginning? I was there very, very early. Wow. That's, I'm so pleased you've still got it as well. That's amazing. Yeah. And I got to see Star Wars 10 days before it opened to the general public on May 25th in the US, 1977. And it was at a screening for a uh, business journalist at the back lot of 20th Century Fox in the Darrell F. Zanuck Theater. And so I was there with a lot of hard bitten journalists, you know, and I still remember the excitement at the beginning of the movie which is something that was repeated for so many of us. When the Star Destroyer goes overhead and all these folks are looking up into the ceiling like, where's that coming from? And, and we all sort of had a giggle to ourselves. And that was, I was just totally taken by the movie. And that was the start. In fact, after the movie was open, I went up to them and I, to the 20th Century Fox people, and I said, could I have my screening pass back, please? So I still have that in my collection too. Wow, that's amazing. Did the did that opening scene actually melt the hearts of all those seasoned journalists as well? Of all the I others? Would say it melted the hearts of many of them. And yeah. on that that was a Saturday morning. And on that Monday, the word had spread that Fox had something really special, and the price of 20th Century Fox stock rose. Mm. So the word had gotten out, and then a week later, Star Wars opened, and there were lines at the theaters, and people wanted, to, well, nobody knew about this movie. It was a big surprise. How did everybody get? Well, it turns out it wasn't such a big surprise, at least in the fan community, because Lucasfilm had gone out 
a year before Star Wars opened to fan conventions, at least in Southern California and Worldcon, which was then in Kansas City that year, and had talked about Star Wars, shown some clips from the movie, shown background pieces. And at Worldcon, they actually showed Darth Vader's costume and uh, some props from the movie and some, some copies of Ralph McQuarrie's pre-production art. So fans were getting very excited about this new movie coming up and people, the word spread and people got in line and that became a story in itself. And so Star Wars became part of the popular culture almost immediately. Is it true that it was, sorry, is it no, true? I was say, something... Amazingly, it stayed that way for 45 years. Is it true that it was something that no one had ever seen before? No one's seen anything like it? Because that's something I hear a lot. No, it's very true. I mean, there have been some great visual effects in movies. I mean, uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick in 2001, A Space Odyssey, it, uh, it was a very trippy kind of movie. I mean, people went to see it <clears throat> a little high sometimes. Uh, but Star Wars was a movie you didn't have to see high. It, 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 it had its own high. The visual effects that Industrial Light and Magic with George Lucas created because the movie studios had done away with all their special and visual effects divisions in the, in the 50s and 60s. But George created this unit and the brilliant people who worked there, the creative people who worked there had come up with ways of doing things that had never been seen on screen before. So the visuals were exciting. The story was fun. The mythology in back of it was great. Uh, the characters were great. And there were some very funny lines in the movie. It, it all worked together to bring a very entertaining movie to the public. That was a really interesting point. I did not know, actually, what you were saying, you know, that before the movie started, they had been preparing the, the scene, if you like, for lack of better words, by going out and telling people about it a year beforehand. Um, that's a point that's often overlooked in a lot of the little uh, the little blurbs that you'll read about the history of Star Wars and stuff like that. It wasn't really an accident. They prepared no. for it. So there was a guy named Charlie Lippincott who was head of marketing, advertising, um, merchandising, and understood because he was a comic book geek himself. He was the one who really pushed to get Marvel Comics, even though Stan Lee was not very excited about doing this. And finally agreed to do a one shot and he convinced them with Roy Thomas, the writer, to do six issues and they started coming out before the movie did. And so um, that market was prepared for Star Wars too. And it was all of this work that, that Charlie Lippincott put into making this something that the true fans would understand and look forward to going to. And that was the beginning of fan relations for Lucasfilm, something that many years later I had tapped into and was head of fan relations for 15 years. Well, what kind of a job is, is, is it to be part of fan relations? Well, it was something that I had to restart because fan relations sort of stopped uh, in 1986 when there were no more Star Wars movies planned. It was a couple of years after Return of the Jedi. And, and Lucasfilm sort of ended its marketing department and fan relations was part of marketing. Um, so it was something I looked into and just sort of naturally fell into because I was a fan of Star Wars. So I was in marketing. I did a lot of other things. My title was director of content management, uh, which meant that I was in charge of the visual assets and worked with all of our internal departments and external magazines and things like that and getting them uh, visuals. Back then it was for the special editions and then for the prequels. But I always had a soft spot for fan relations and we kept getting content letters and then the start of emails and people asking questions and one thing Lucasfilm has always done from the very beginning is tried to answer all fan questions that come in, regardless of how they come in. So um, there was always a response there. And that's something that they have continued to this day. One thing I remember from Lucasfilm, um, from, from when I was a kid, uh, there was a computer game called Day of the Tentacle. Yes. That was Luke, I was such a massive fan of that. I, I never realized that Lucasfilm, like that 
films and games. I don't know if it was just a small, you know, a little thing that they did or if they did more games. It was a, it was a very popular division back at the time, Lucas, Lucas Arts, it was called Lucas Arts Entertainment. And, um, and at one point the company had, the full company had that name for about a year or two before they changed the names back again. But they did some great games other than Star Wars games that people really remember um, and love. And they're bringing back some of those games in a retro kind of way. But the games division has been reestablished after it was done away with under Disney and uh, it farmed out. But now Lucas game, Lucasfilm Games has come back very strong and is doing new Star Wars games. Uh, working with other outside video game companies. Mm, can I ask, a, I don't know if this is a question that I should ask, um, uh -oh. but the, 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 the Lucasfilm and Disney, the, it's combined, I guess, or something. What is it that Lucasfilm does now that is just LF, may I ask? Well, it's just, it's sort of like Marvel and Pixar. So these are all divisions, Lucasfilm, Marvel, and Pixar divisions of Disney. And they do their own thing when it comes to making the TV and movies. And, uh, and then they work with Disney overall on overall marketing and merchandising and things of like that. So it's integrated at certain levels and it's individual on, on other levels. So it's all, it's all combined, but people working in their own silos. Sounds really complicated. <laughs> Go well, ahead. When you run a multi-billion dollar company like Disney, which is the world's largest entertainment company, it gets complicated. Uh, I had a look at, uh, was it Disney's, Disney's marketing kind of bubble chart? And they've got so many arrows going off everywhere. They just cover all their bases. Yeah, right. It's really well thought out. Um, so, when when did you first discover um, sketch cards? Well, it, it's actually a little broader than that. When I started doing conventions, I, I as a fan, I attended a lot of conventions myself. So I was at San Diego Comic-Con in the early years. I went to local conventions. I lived in Los Angeles at the time and went to these uh, comic book conventions and Star Trek conventions. And I would find all kinds of things like copies of Star Wars scripts and early toys that I had missed and uh, some, shall we say, fan-made objects. And, um, but I was really impressed with the art and it, that became an evolving sort of thing. And in 1996, I joined Lucasfilm for what was supposed to be a one year only job to go out and tell fans around the country at conventions what the special editions were all about to get them excited about the special edition. So just like Charlie Lippincott had done in 1976, I was there in 1996, 20 years later, telling folks about the Star Wars, Empire, and Jedi special edition. And I would go to these conventions and I would see artists who I didn't know doing wonderful Star Wars art, very exciting stuff. And I would go up to them and say, I'm with Lucasfilm and they would look like, is he gonna sue us? Because there are certain other movie studios with certain other science fiction and fantasy uh, genre uh, uh, products and uh, movies and TV shows that went out of their way to give cease and desist daughters. And, and Lucasfilm did a little bit of that in the early years, but I think they learned from their mistakes in the early years. and realized that letting fans and people with artistic talents, uh, whether it's 2D or 3D, play in George Lucas' sandbox was a good thing because that just expanded the entire market and expanded fans' interest and excitement about Star Wars. And I would go up to these folks and admire their art and get to meet them. And, and there are a number of artists out there who whether it's true or not, give me credit for starting them on their careers in Star Wars. Um, people like Brian Rood, who is just a tremendous Star Wars artist and a good friend. Um, Randy Martinez, who I literally 
literally bumped into at the first Star Wars celebration in Denver. I mean, smack into. I was looking, he had this wonderful, uh, funny t-shirt, Star Wars t-shirt that he had uh, drawn. And I was looking at his t-shirt and didn't realize I was walking right into him and he's a big guy. Um, but through these contacts and then I would I would go back to Lucasfilm and, and tell our, the, the, the head of, uh, uh, of the art department, Troy Alders, who is still there, who is still working with artists all over the world on style guides and things of that nature and, and get, getting artists in touch with licensees. Um, and I would tell Troy about these great artists and give them contacts or give the artist Troy's contact. And slowly we evolved this kind of informal network of uh, fan artists and really good artists. And that's the way a lot of them got started. I remember Katie Cook meeting her in the early days. And I mean, just wonderful artists who, who are still very active in doing their own art and doing Star Wars art. Mm -hmm. So that's really, uh, in, in effect, Lucasfilm is letting artists kind of do the work for them in many ways and promoting, and as you said, playing around. And that, that's a really good idea and fun for us. <laughs> um, and providing some income, which is always helpful for an artist. Yes. People don't realize, people, people ask, oh, could you do that for me? Uh, well, yeah, my fee is you charge, but it's just <laughs> art. Oh my God! If I hear that one more time, I scream because this is all work, mm -hmm. writing, art, anything you do takes time, creativity, and it's your bread and butter. And there's some people who don't understand that, and that's very frustrating. I've yeah. been asked to do. <clears throat> I've been asked to do a quick painting before. Can you just do me a quick painting? No, <laughs> no, it won't be quick. <laughs> It won't be quick and it will cost a little something. Yeah, but then they're so like... I first, got, I first got involved with with Topps cards by collecting them in in 1977. The first Star Wars, of the five sets of Star Wars cards, three sets of uh, Empire cards. I think there were three sets and two sets of Jedi cards. And in got to know the guy who was vice president uh, for entertainment products at Tops, a guy named Ira Friedman was an early head of the fan club at Lucasfilm. And it turned out when I visited Lucasfilm at their Los Angeles headquarters at the time, before they moved the whole company up to Northern California, it turned out I met Ira. I got some early copies of the Bantha tracks that I had missed. And it turned out he knew my brother in Philadelphia, he played tennis with them. I mean, it's the world's whole world of contacts. <laughs> and in the early 90s, Ira called and said, we're doing this new product called Star Wars Galaxy. And we're doing a couple of sets if they're, if they're popular. And we'd like you to work with Gary Gerani, who is the guy who wrote a lot of the early top sets on Star Wars and worked closely with tops on a lot of other projects. And he said, we'd like you to, Gary is going to hire artists to do new Star Wars art, but we'd like it to be half and half new Star Wars art and existing Star Wars art. So it was my job to scare up all of the existing Star Wars art that had been done over the previous uh, almost 20 years. And um, I knew collectors who had purchased some of these things. We arranged for photos to be taken. So I got involved in the tops world early on in the 90s. And, and then in 90, in 96, they hired me to write the uh, two sets of the wide vision special edition trading cards. And that was fun. So I have a background in tops and tops cards and collecting tops cards and working with artists. And they all come together in the sketch card era. So did, have you got every single set they've ever done then, would you say? I did. <laughs> did. And a couple of years ago, I mean, I retired from Lucasfilm in 2011 and took over the collection that I put together at Rancho Obi-Wan, which is a nonprofit institution. Nonprofits do not pay their 
executives very much money and we're a very small nonprofit. I am now executive chairman and Newman is president and chief executive officer. She's been with us for 16 years. And um, the amount of money coming in now is a lot less than when I was collecting in the early years. And so there's less money to buy things I have to pick and choose. Now, one of the things that I was always picking and choosing very carefully were the Topps cards because I love the full sets of the Topps cards. And then Topps went a little crazy in my view. They started doing eight, 10, 12 sets a year, different sets. And then a lot of the sets had multiple layers. There would be a base set and then there would be a red version of the base set, a blue version, a green version, and a gold version, and they each had fewer and fewer cards. And I'm a completist. If I'm going to get sets of cards, I want them all. And then the autograph cards, and then the sketch cards. Well, one set, and I can't remember exactly which set it was, it turned out, Anne said, you know, you spent almost $10,000 buying all these cards because I was... I mean, and I didn't have $10,000 to spend, but I, by putting it together over a year and a half, buying cards on eBay, some of the sketch cards got really expensive. Um, and uh, I said, well, you know, that's just crazy. And then Tops stopped supplying cards to comic book shops. You had to buy them a certain way. So my comic book shop dealer stopped uh, being able to get the Tops cards in the boxes. And my main tops person, a guy named Rich Smullen, who dealt with a lot of the artists personally. Rich is a great guy. He's now a director of Rancho Obi-Wan. And so I would buy all my tops cards through him and he would come over and we would sort through him because he lived nearby. He lives in Arizona now. And so those were fun days, but he got out of the business too because some of these box sets with four packs were selling for $100 in the hobby shop. And Four packs for $100 is a bit much. And mm -hmm. then the ability to get a complete set is a bit much. So I am afraid that my Topps Cards collection stops about five years ago. And I understand completely what you're saying. I used to, I used to collect Ninja Turtles mm -hmm. stuff. And recently, that, that many different companies have been licensing it. I can't keep up. I've had to give up. I collect uh, Rick and now. <laughs> I mean, the Star Wars license under Disney, they license now in seven different areas of the world. And I love getting the international stuff. And I still have friends who are using my money go and especially in Spain and um, England and some in Japan. Um, so I get things of that nature, but it's it's very difficult and it's become impossible. So I say I'm still a completist, but that just means I would like to have everything, not that I could possibly have everything. I don't even think the Disney archives or the Lucasfilm archives has every single product. That's a shame. And it's a shame for the regular people like us. You know, if we want to collect something, you simply can't afford it. You can't afford it. You can't find it. Um, and you started before there was really an internet, really, Technically, so that that must be, it must be really quite something to have experienced the change from what I remember of no internet. You had to actually go to a store or buy a magazine where you'd get addresses to to, to send snail mail to and stuff like that. To now, where you can have like you can find out anything like now if you want to. That's that's a like a mind blowingly big change. I saved all of those snail mail catalogs, you know, sort of the hand printed mimeograph catalogs. So I have boxes, bankers boxes filled with a lot of these catalogs from the 70s and the 80s, listing all the Star Wars stuff you could have and prices in them. And oh, my goodness, it's a treasure trove of history. I just love looking through that kind of stuff. It's amazing you had the thought to save them all. I mean, like, magazines are usually the kind of thing that goes in the bin, isn't it, when they start getting tatty and worn out? And we have really rare. We have 9,000 square feet in the museum and a 7,000 square foot offsite warehouse, and both of them are filled. And it's hard to find space for anything else. I, I have found space for Ingrid's books, though. 
Oh, <laughs> sorry. Whereabouts is the museum located again? We're about 40 miles north of San Francisco in a town of 60,000 people called Petaluma, California. And uh, it's a nice bedroom community for San Francisco. I live on the outskirts of town, so it's semi-rural. We've got chickens. It used to be a former chicken ranch. And so what once housed 20,000 hens up until the early 1970s, now houses the world's largest Star Wars memorabilia collection. Oh, that's we incredible. Were, we chickens. <laughs> well, we still have chickens. We've got 16 chickens right now. Oh, so we brought the chickens so back. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, uh, the, the whole nonprofit organization, you also help kids, I believe, with reading and things like that, don't you? We do tours for younger kids, school kids. Of course, that all stopped during the pandemic. But we've had classes here and we talk about whatever the teacher is teaching them, whether it's art, whether it's history, whether it's science. And so we try to orient the tours to what the kids are talking about or learning or just as an entertainment kind of uh, offsite trip for them. And we have older groups here, some of the uh, um, uh, alternately abled uh, folks and um, it's, it's just a joy to be doing that. We also give uh, um, tours for two or four away to other local charities in order for them to put it out when they're raising money and then they can, people can uh, get the tours and come and visit the Rancho if you want. What do you think of, uh, do you see a future for trading cards and sketch cards and things like that? Well, I do. At first, I was uh, sort of puzzled by Tops going online and the Tops trading card app, but I got into it. They asked me to try it, and I got I started trading, and it was sort of fun, but then it got a little too complicated for me, and I put it away for a while, and I tried to get back into it, and I don't understand it right now. It's gotten a, the levels of complexity are, are, are beyond my comprehension, um, but the, some of the new cards are just beautiful. I think sketch cards have improved markedly. In the early days of sketch cards, they were just interested in having quantity. And they allowed artists to do up to 2,000 cards, of which they were paying a buck or two per card. So people wanted to do a lot of cards to make a little money. And some of those early sketch cards were terrible. Some really good artists who just spent like, it seemed 10 seconds per card with a pencil sketch, that's not happening anymore. The card quality has gone way up and, uh, and the art on the base cards is beautiful. So I admire the product. I just don't know where to get it or, or be able to afford it. Um, and that's just a personal thing because uh, there are other things that have become as exciting or more exciting to me. So I regret having stopped the tops collecting, but there was just no way that it was easy for me to get these cards and get the box sets and get um, the, put the, the complete collection together. So what else are you collecting now? Should I ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, my collecting um, likes have changed over the last 10 years, I think, last 10 to 15 years. And I am heavily into original art and um, fan-made objects such as these uh, art figures that they do that are not really bootleg, they're really artist-made figures that are, that are a parody of Star Wars. They're funny or they're sad. You have some? She makes some. <laughs> oh, you make some? I, I love bootleg stuff. Uh, uh, fan-made, really... fan Lindsay. Fan-made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fan-made. <laughs> not, not bootleg, Lindsay. Not, not bootleg. bootleg. Not bootleg. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> fan-made <laughs> stuff. My word. I mean, I've, I've got this little guy. I love him. <laughs> oh, wow. He's like Very a nipple. Cool. <clears throat> no, such amazing stuff, don't they? 
they do. I mean, and that's what I love. And and because I become um, uh, friends with so many of the artists uh, and see them at shows, of course, again, the last two and a half years have been very difficult. And we just had a big Star Wars celebration in Anaheim, California. But we also, Rancho Obi-Wan was asked to fill a 5,000 square foot room. And so I never got out of that room except for doing a couple of panels. So I never got down to the floor to meet my artist friends, which was a big regret of the show. But we had a lot of people coming. We did a, a, a special focus on Boba Fett and the Mandalorians and their evolution. And we combined four collections. So people who are on our board of directors, four major collections, mine, Gus Lopez, Duncan Jenkins, and um, Lisa Stevens and her husband, Vic Wirtz. And we picked the best items from the collection and were able to spread out in this room and show people Boba Fett and the evolution of Boba Fett and the whole Mandalorian subculture through merchandise, props, art. Uh, it was a very exciting exhibition to put together. It took us three solid months of work, uh, mainly Ann Newman putting it together. And That's amazing. What, what props have you, have you got from the movies that you know, you're especially proud of having collected or you've always got on display? Well, I've got a full-sized mannequin with a Darth Vader costume. The helmet and mask were apparently screen used in The Empire Strikes Back. The cod piece says Bourbons and Nathans, which was the original costumer, and says Darth Vader on it. And the rest of the costume is mostly an appearance costume that they used to send a Darth, an actor around to various locations. I've got the original Boba Fett rifle. When Boba Fett was first conceived, he was in an all-white costume. They were going to do Mandalorian Super Commandos. And they decided, George decided, Number one, it was impractical to make all these new costumes. And number two, George decided he wanted it in different colors rather than just the all white like the stormtroopers. But there are photos that exist and there's a film clip with Ben Burke interviewing the person who's in the, uh, in the all white Boba Fett costume. And he's holding this um, rifle and uh, I've got that rifle the original prototype Boba Fett rifle in the collection. Wow. So that's one of my prized possessions. I've had other things that I've traded out over the years um, or sold to bring in money for Rancho Obi-Wan, um, but uh, it's all good. I have fun doing what I do. People get excited doing the tours. We've really booked, we only do tours uh, on, with rare exceptions on Saturday mornings but we've gotten so many requests because we've been closed for so long that we're a lot of Saturdays we're doing two tours, double duty. Tours are done by docents that we've trained uh, with a lot of my stories. It's all about the stories uh, and uh, how things got into the collection, uh, why this was made, uh, how could they ever make something like this? Um, and we have a wonderful art gallery that includes the world's largest Star Wars painting, a 15 foot by eight foot beautiful mm. painted mm. Uh, uh, saga based on the toys of the original trilogy done by Robert Xavier Burden, uh, San Francisco. He's a Canadian artist who lived in San Francisco at the time, now lives in San Diego, California, and it's on semi-permanent loan to Rancho Obi-Wan. It filled one huge wall in the art gallery. And then the rest of the art gallery has um, original paintings and constructions. Uh, and it's one of my favorite places in the whole museum. And I, I have so many, we have to change it out every year or so because there's so many framed pieces that we have uh, of original art and, and then hundreds of pieces of posters and uh, other art that, that people have done, that Acme Archives has sold. Um, so the art just shows me the passion that artists and fans have for Star Wars and the extent of the items that they've made, that they've painted, um, that they've drawn, um, just shows the breadth of Star Wars, unlike any of the other genre movies. You just don't see that with even Star Trek or Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, it's that 
wonderful feeling that you get that these these folks are as excited about Star Wars as you are as a collector. You started writing your career, your whole career. You, you were a writer way back in the in the beginning, and that has obviously taken you far. You have a deep love of words, of story. Um, I guess your your collecting habits are perhaps maybe directed a little bit by where you come from in all of that. Is that possible? I think that's true. I think, and and my very first Star Wars book came out. My very first book was something on a process, a psychological process called aversion therapy, which was used in punishment therapy to get people to stop smoking, drinking, I mean, quite disgusting. But I wrote a front page story for the Wall Street Journal on it in the 70s and got approached by a publisher saying that they wanted to do a book based on the story. And I thought this will be the only chance in my life that I get to write a book. So I took it and, um, the publisher thought this was going to be a self-help book, but I think injecting drugs that make you nauseous once you see a picture of or smell cigarette butts is not a self-help kind of program that you can do. So um, the book, the book was the book, and but it, it got me. It showed me how to write a book and put together a book. And in the early '90s, I heard that Lucasfilm before before I knew anything about Lucasfilm, I had done a um, interview with George Lucas on the telephone about the 10th anniversary of Star Wars that I wrote for an off-edit page feature in the Wall Street Journal. And that was a great opportunity to talk to, to George and to meet his public relations person. I wanted to do it at Skywalker Ranch. I was told, no, George will do it on the phone for a half an hour. You have a half an hour with him on the phone. So I eventually got to Skywalker Ranch for many years. Um, but um, I had heard in the early 90s that Lucasfilm was considering doing a, an official Star Wars price guide. And I cold called the, the lady who was the new uh, head of publishing of Lucasfilm because they hadn't done books for many years. And I said, if anybody does this book, it should be me. And she said, and you are who? And I tried to explain my background and she was intrigued. And she said, well, we really want a price guide with anecdotes. And I said, you can't have a price guide with anecdotes. That's a different kind of book. So in talking it out, it became my very first Star Wars book called Star Wars from Concept to Screen to Collectibles. And it, it's a book that many collectors today say started them on the road to Star Wars collecting. They saw how much there was out there, pre-production pieces from Kenner products and foreign objects and things of that nature. It was a very exciting book to do. I got to, to meet George in person and sit down for two and a half hours with him in his office. Um, so that was uh, that was one of my rewards. And and I just love people blaming me for starting them on the road to collecting or thanking me for starting them on the road to collecting one way or the other. And um, the, the best thing of it all over all these years is being able to meet fellow collectors and fellow fans all over the world when I went and did conventions in Europe, everywhere from uh, Spain to England to Finland, um, France, uh, Japan, uh, just, I mean, meeting wonderful people and, and, and connecting via Star Wars and Star Wars art, especially. It's amazing, like connecting through a fandom, isn't it? It's like a big family. I wonder what I'm going to do with all those wonderful sketch cards. They're all in binders now. I was I love looking. I, I love was looking. I'm so sorry. I, I was I was going to ask you, um, what do you see for the future for your your habits, your collecting habits, and perhaps uh, will you be starting any uh, any new endeavors? Well, we're with our board of directors, we're discussing long-term strategy for Rancho Obi-Wan, which people can visit. We have an online uh, virtual museum. So it's ranchoobiwan.org. And the links in the show notes. And that's where you can uh, uh, book tours and become a member and support Rancho Obi-Wan. Um, and, you know, our, our main object is to preserve Star Wars history through merchandising and 
tell the stories of Star Wars merchandising and memorabilia and the art and the artists um, who have been involved in it over all these years. And uh, it's, it's a very exciting endeavor and we're looking to our five and 10 year plans as to what we want to do here. It would be nice to have a bigger space to be able to actually show pages from these um, binders. I've got 30, 40 binders of, of trading cards, not just top cards, but the early Wonder Bread cards and foreign card sets and sticker sets. And oh my God, that'd be awesome to see. <laughs> so much, so much stuff. I have friends who are fellow card collectors and they'll come here and other people will be going through the museum and they'll be in the card room just looking through the binders and going through things. It's it's really amazing what uh, what you can come up with and what you can collect over the years. And there's so have many you, entries. I don't know if this if that if this would be possible, but have you thought about producing your own um, Rancho Obi Wan sketch cards? You know, to get kids interested in drawing and well. It's funny you ask that because at Celebration, um, we had a trading card set that we were selling that, that involved the, um, the exhibit. So we had giant uh, wall posters with information about what you were seeing in the exhibit and different areas of Boba Fett and the Mandalorians and um, <clears throat> you could buy the sketch card set. You could that was the base set. You could collect the other cards, the special cards. And there was one blank card that we handed people on the exit, and we asked them to sketch on it. And so we have over three hundred and fifty sketch cards that we're going to be putting on the website. We've already put some up on the wall of the website, um, and we've had everybody from three-year-old kids scratching out a little Yoda to Dave Filoni doing a bo uh, and uh, and some other artists coming up and, and doing sketch cards. So sketch cards are still alive at Rancho Obi-Wan and uh, we love them. And, uh, and this was a brilliant idea to do it. And people really got into it and loved doing it. And so That's having fans do their own sketch cards was just a brilliant idea on Anne's part and uh it it turned out really well and people really really got into it I mean I've been hoping to do it do that at comic cons here in the UK because the sketch card market it's just not as big here as it is in America and and like China now as well um so I thought maybe I could get some blanks and like give them out and see if I can get, you know, see if I can get the kids drawing because collecting it used to be a lot to do with the kids as well, didn't it? What we did is put out like a little idea of what kind of sketch cards they could do and how to do a, you know, step by step, how to do a Yoda figure. And so to have something there for them that they could look at so they would feel like they could do it. Um, yeah. I think that really helped. That's um, an amazing idea. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> but I was I was amazed and thrilled with the with the turnout we got for the sketch card area. Then you say that's, is that on your website? You say you can no, view the, the artwork. We've well done. put some. We've put some on our social media. We, Rancho Obi Wan has Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook accounts, and so we we put up some photos of them. But we're going to put out the sketch cards individually at some point when things calm down a little. That's, That's amazing. amazing. I think it's so, so cool getting the, getting kids into it for the fun of it like it used to be. Uh, I remember actually getting some cards when I was quite young. And, uh, you know, you, you just can't do it anymore as a kid. It's all way too expensive for, for even now for a little kid and stuff like that. What are you thinking of the, the series, the Mandalorian series and the Obi-Wan series? I personally, before anybody says anything, I love them both. I will put it right on the table. I love them both. I, love I will put it right on the table. I love them both too. <laughs> I've been very excited by the by the uh, by the series and and seeing it on a weekly basis rather than having them all out there all at once. I think it's a great idea. So you get a chance to talk about them and digest them. And I think the hardcore Star Wars fan um, really loves them too. There was all this negativity on the internet about everything. But uh, 
I just ignore that. And uh, it, it's just ridiculous. I think the stories, the acting, the visual effects that they are able to do these days on a, on a television or a streaming project is just amazing. And I'm looking forward to seeing Andor because I really love Rogue One. And, oh, yes, um, love and Rogue Ahsoka, One too. And the Ahsoka series. And so there's very exciting times ahead for Star Wars fans, I think. It's really cool to see you and McGregor back too. I mean, yeah. I gotta say, I'm a big fan of, of him and 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 then the story with with Leia, of course, where I don't want to go into spoilers or anything, but it's really cool. I, yeah, I just love is. what's coming out. Yeah, I do too. I get, we're about to see our final episode of the Obi Wan series. <laughs> That's the one thing they're so the series the series are so short now. Really short six episodes. Yeah, I. You know what? I, I don't think that's a bad idea. Some of these other series on some of the streaming services, I look and see 12 episodes. I don't know that I'm up for this. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Have you gotten into some of them that have like 22 episodes and all of that? <laughs> I, I, can't, I, mean, I can watch episodic television as long as it's not one story over 22 episodes. There could be some oh, yeah. part of it that continues, but these things are like one story and they go on for 12 long complex episodes and I'm just, it's too much work for some of them. They're not that engaging. The Star Wars series are very engaging. And yes. I, I really like them. I do like the new habit where on many of the shows, you know, you'll have a storyline and it, it only lasts for a couple of episodes. You don't yeah. have to go on for an endless amount of time. I got to say, that? Lindsay got me into watching Twin Peaks, which isn't... Uh, oh. <laughs> Which is like really out the window. That's totally different. The, the original Twin Peaks? Yes, the original. I watched every single episode. And then the final episode, I, have you seen? No them spoilers. I'm up, to, uh, I'm up to the end of season two now. Okay. Well, that's all it was. Two seasons. I believe there are three. Aren't there three seasons? Well, I thought back they... after 25 years, didn't it? Because that, that, I don't know if this will be a spoiler or not, but she actually says, you'll see me again in 25 years. And then they brought it back. Oy. Season 25 years later. Oh, God. Well, I'm right. I think, where am I up to? Uh, uh, the end of, uh, I think it's episode 13 of season two or something like that. Okay. I'll, I'd be very curious to hear what you think uh, when the whole season wraps. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious too, because I can't see where it's going. It's like, I just don't know what to expect. I mean, from this never be able to see where like, that's going. It's like I, nobody could figure out where that was going. I don't think <laughs> David Lynch. <laughs> some of the visuals, you know, in that show, it's just, I sit there and it's like, wow, this is so cool. Yeah. Some of the, yeah. the visuals, it, it tells its own story that has nothing to do with the story that's going on right now, but you'll see this visual with people situated in certain positions with, with stuff behind them, and it's like, oh, well, gee, you know, and you kind of have to go back and look. at It's really cool. I really like that. So now it's like I kind of like to see some of this stuff happening in some of the newer shows. I find some of the newer shows bring a lot of really cool things to them, but they've thrown a lot of the a lot of the subtle things out the window, which I kind of miss that in Twin Peaks, you definitely do have, and Preacher also, actually, but yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. Preacher, but I've heard good things about it. Oh yeah, that, uh, that read is- it. I'm not seeing it. <laughs> I, I have seen it and not read it. I can't afford comic books, but uh, Preacher is different. It's pretty violent though, just so you know, it's, it's pretty violent. What do you mean you can't afford it? You're an artist. Don't artists yeah. make tons of money? <laughs> yeah, we all laugh. So what do you think, speaking of all this, I'm sorry, I kind of drilled everything there. What do you think of the future of traditional art? Oh, I think it has a great future. I, I, I think, um, although so many artists have gone into doing their art digitally, so there's the question of, what is an original? Um, but if they say they've only printed out one version of it, I mean, that George Lucas under contract had the right of refusal on all original art, whether it was for a product or a comic book or a book cover, certainly posters that would be part of the contract, but he had right of first refusal. And back in the day, I wondered what will happen 
when all of this goes digital. And what he has purchased digital copies of, I mean, because that is the original art. You can't purchase the computer. Mm. You can purchase an NFT, I guess, but I, I'm not crazy about those. Um, but I think that original art, regardless of how it's done, has a bright future. I mean, we always want a movie poster. Unfortunately, most studios have moved into the Photoshop version of movie posters, but an artist can look at an entire movie, read the entire script, and can synthesize what the whole movie is about in the art. The main point, the drive, get the emotion in there, and that is next to impossible to do with a Photoshop poster. I mean, some of the Photoshop posters are cool, but the art can't be surpassed. And there are very few posters that are being done by artists these days, unfortunately. But otherwise, I think there is a brilliant future for art. And I think we all need that art to sustain ourselves and to sustain the creativity in the artistic community too. That's a really good point about the creativity. I mean, I've seen, <laughs> there's new websites popping up and it's AI art and it, you know, computer generated art that the computer just does itself. So it takes all the principles of art, the colors and the composition and everything, but it can't quite get a face right yet. And I'd really doubt it would be able to take a script and take all the most entertaining bits out of it and make, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that that's anything that computers are ever going to be able to do, fingers crossed. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> we suspect. <laughs> suspect, yeah. Um, so what, what advice would you have for visual artists who are still struggling out there? Well, well I would traditional say, ones, especially. Yeah, I would say to keep keep at it, try to find some um, benefactors, some collectors uh, who will commission you to do certain pieces of their favorite characters. Um, try to hook up with a company like Tops, um, retailers, um, manufacturers who are licensing more and more of the pop culture products. Um, and it's not easy to get a foot in, but a lot of people have done it through going to conventions, which is not the easiest way in the world to make a living, but because it's become fairly costly at a lot of these conventions to get a table or a setup. Um, just try to get yourself out there, have a social media presence um, and, and keep at it. Okay. Lindsay, do you have any few any more questions before we uh, slowly head on head on out and let him go? Oh, I could be nosy all day. <laughs> but yeah, no, we should wrap it up now, I think. Stephen, this has been amazing. Where can people find you if you want to be found? If I want to be found, I can be found at ranchoobiwan.org. And I have a an open Facebook account, a Steve Sansweet. Facebook account and a Stephen J. Sansweet Facebook account, um, uh, which is more uh, active. But uh, Rancho Obi Wan uh, is available on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Okay. And we have a great social media person, Concetta Parker, who uh, tries to post something new every day. And um, we're going to resume posting new acquisitions. Um, which we had been doing up until the uh, the uh, <clears throat> pandemic, and we'll continue doing that in the near future. So a lot of good things ahead for Rancho Obi-Wan. That's amazing, and I highly suggest that collectors out there take a look at all the things that Rancho Obi-Wan offers. It's, it's really a great cause, and, and uh, all those kids that get to come and visit. And I, like I said, I think you do support reading programs too for kids, which I think is yes. so essential. Yeah. We have sent Star Wars books out to age appropriate groups too. That's too great. Thank you immensely. I'll let you get back to your busy day. Thank you so much for having come on. Really appreciate it. It has been such a treat to talk to you and to listen to you. My pleasure, ladies. Great to hook up with you. Thank you so much, Steve. Bye. Thank you so much. 